the famous people and inventions and heroic individualism. Now, most people read Bartleby as an existentialist narrative, and it definitely is that. But for me, the story's subtitle proves that it's also about the market economy. The full title of the story is Bartleby the Scrivener, a story of Wall Street. I'll see you next week. Crash Course is produced and directed by Stan Mo. Okay, any questions about the video? I was going to ask, what was the year that the canal system started, or the steam, uh, I think the steamboats kind of took off? The steamboat was 1807. Okay, thank you. Cool. All right, let me, any other questions? Okay, hopefully you all can see my PowerPoint here, Lecture 14, The Market Revolution. Yes, Professor. Excellent. All right, so the market revolution, as you heard John Green describe it, is this huge transformation in America in the 19th century as the United States kind of carves out a sphere for itself as a, an industrializing and growing economy with better infrastructure and better communications. And this is what makes it possible for people to move westward for the United States to sort of prosper. So there's a lot of changes that are, um, that are associated with the market revolution that I'm going to be talking about. These are some uh, steamboat captains. This is a later picture. This is not from the early 1900s, but of course steamboats are one of the transportational shifts that we're going to see today. This right here is the Erie Canal. And, which I will be talking more about momentarily, but it is new transportation uh, possibilities that really are the initial steps in the market revolution. Okay, so what is going on between 1800 and 1840 in the American economy? Well, first of all, the population was growing. Um, a lot of this was due to immigration from um, Northern and Western Europe. And much of the population was uh, occurring through migration to the Western uh, part of the Appalachian Mountains. So if you look here at the um, United States in 1840 map, you see that the original 13 colonies had been joined by a number of other states in the Old Southwest and Old Northwest. Population growth and westward movement were causes of the formation of cities in the interior, cities that we call entrepots. An entrepot starts out as a a sort of trading area for farmers to trade their excess crops or things that they need, um, like farm implements and processing of their grain. Okay, so there's tends to be grain mills. And then over time, as you start to get more influx of population into these entrepots, they begin to take on other um, other features, they begin to specialize in different forms of industry. So to give you one example, Cincinnati was founded in 1788 as a military fort. Then it became an entrepot um, with a lot of service industries and goods uh, for restaurants and hotels and a place where goods could be shipped downstream to New Orleans, which was 1,500 miles away. And because plying the Mississippi was uh, possible by steamboat, after steamboats were invented in America in 1807, Cincinnati became a center of steamboat production and also machine tool production. So you have these cities that start off just as 
like little nexuses for farmers who have moved inland, and then they begin to specialize in particular industries. Having said this, as you heard from the video, the Atlantic ports were still the most important for shipping because it was so expensive initially to move goods over land. You heard, you know, 30 miles shipping to the east cost the same as shipping something across the Atlantic. That's how difficult it was in the absence of roads or the absence of canals. The most important cities were New York, especially after the completion of the Erie Canal, Philadelphia, Boston, Charleston, South Carolina, and Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, however, the United States was still largely an agricultural nation. 94% of Americans lived in communities of 2,500 people or fewer. And especially in the northern part of the U.S., 80% of families farmed the land, usually for personal consumption. We won't get the number of people working in non-agriculture outweighing the number of people working in agriculture until the 1920s, believe it or not. Okay, any questions so far? So were roads morally constructed because of so many people tramped like and following the trail or because they were like, we need to dig a road? And well, the roads were constructed because they were uh, people, investors were able to uh, gain a profit by joining together into a road building organization, constructing a road, and then charging tolls. So it's just like any other kind of business practice in the 19th century. It served a particular purpose, but it also made investors a profit. Other questions? Questions from Zoom people? Uh, I was wondering, does the word entrepot, does that have any connection with the word entrepreneur? I don't know, something to do with business? I mean. Uh, that's a good question and one that I do not know the answer to, but I can find out and tell you um, probably through a Canvas announcement. Okay, I was just curious. That's a good question. Other questions? All right, so then what happens? Well, the first thing that happens is new forms of transportation are created that um, begin to kind of shift the balance of American population away from the East Coast a little. Starting in 1818, the National Road um, was begun, and eventually it would connect all of the state capitals from Virginia to Illinois. The National Road is interesting because it was being constructed with the support of the federal government, whereas normally um, internal improvements, quote unquote, up until that time had been done within individual states. Other roads called turnpikes were built by private subscription, and then people could use them um, by paying tolls, as I said a moment ago. Uh, there is a uh, little map here showing you some of the major turnpikes and roads. And when I say roads, these were generally speaking not paved roads, um, although some of them were plank roads where uh, trees would be felled and then road builders put the planks on the ground for people to drive over. Roads were never the transportation um, favorite mode in this time period because they had a tendency to be bumpy and muddy and often blocked by fallen trees. So uh, other forms of transportation were preferable. Canals were much more predictable. 
The early 19th century saw a profusion of canals being built. Uh, one of the most important public works achievements of the time was the Erie Canal, as you heard about in John Green's video introduction to this topic. It went a total of, he says, 363 miles. I have 364 in my notes. But what's interesting about the canal is that it encompasses such a long distance that there are a lot of altitude changes. And the only way that you can kind of make that work for shipping is to build locks. A lock is a mechanism for changing the water level of your, of your boat, of your canal barge. What happens is, it, let's say you're going upstream with your goods. You bring your canal boat into the lock, and the lock has um, gates at either end. And the gates are closed, and then water is let in from the uh, higher side to bring your boat up to the level of the water kind of upstream. And then the upper set of gates is opened and you can continue on. The same is true in the opposite direction. You know, the um, water is let out through the lower gate, your boat lowers, and you can move on. Um, locks are a really um, good sort of civil engineering um, innovation, but all of this stuff was created by hand for the Erie Canal. And they didn't really have modern tools. They didn't have any kind of um, modern uh, excavation tools. All of it was done by people with shovels, mostly Irish immigrants. Um, I've traveled on the Erie Canal in a canal boat. You can rent one from various little towns alongside the canal, and you can go through the locks. They still exist. It's really sort of impressive and actually maybe even a little bit scary um, because John Green's video showed one lock where you go up like five different steps until you get to the top and that actually exists. And we went on that one and it was, um, it's still kind of awesome today. And I mean that in the 19th century sense of awe-inspiring. How big are these boats? How big are the um, The boat that we were on was, 48 feet long and probably maybe eight feet wide or 10 feet wide. Um, the maximum uh, speed that they go today is about four miles an hour. And in the 19th century, in the time that we're talking about, these were mostly, uh, these were mostly being dragged by mules that walked along the towpath to the side of the canal and a boy would kind of like, um, hurry the mule along as much as you can hurry a mule, and the mule would be able to drag the, um, the barge. But today, of course, they have motors. Uh, the development of the steamboat was particularly important for plying the Mississippi River in an upstream direction. It had always been possible to float goods downstream on the Mississippi, that was not very difficult, but going upstream could take months because how people did it was they would be a flat barge with a number of men with very long poles and they would actually just pull their way along going upstream. So you wouldn't want to do that for very far. Steamboats were developed in 1807 and um, they were great for going upstream except for as boats that were propelled by steam. Um, they relied on boilers to create the pressure. And nobody really understood the science of um, pressurized boilers. And so often they exploded. Uh, steamboat explosion was responsible, for example, for the death of Mark Twain's younger brother. He was a, an apprentice learning how to become a steamboat captain. Uh, he was something like 14 years old. He was on his first steamboat voyage. The steamboat exploded and he was killed. Steamboat boilers were one of the first things ever regulated by Congress in terms of regulations put on business to um, 
require more safety. And that happened in 1842. Ultimately, of course, uh, railroads are also invented, but in the time that we're talking about, uh, up until about 1840, um, they're not an important form of transportation yet. The first transcontinental uh, railroad isn't finished until 1867. Now, what is the impact of these new transportation possibilities? A number of things. First of all, if it became less costly to move goods either into the interior or out of the interior, what happens to the price of those goods? It goes up. No, it goes down. Yes, it goes down oh. because the the input into those goods becomes less, you know, the, the, the impact of um, shipping uh, makes the price less. Now, if you decrease the price for something, what happens to the demand for that something? Yeah, it goes up. So we have falling prices for things that's causing more demand. That is kind of an engine for the economy. People in the interior who used to not be able to get their hands on, say, um, factory-created textiles or English um, porcelain or, you know, just whatever is being produced, suddenly are able to buy more of that stuff because the price goes down. The new transportation possibilities also shift the population into the interior. Towns sprang up along the new transportation routes. Local economies became much more complex. People had more of a need for cash. I mean, there was really a barter system in place in a lot of rural areas before the penetration of the market economy. So, if you look at um, store records, you'll see, okay, somebody brought some cheese and I gave them, you know, this amount of credit for their cheese and then they used that credit to buy this amount of textiles. But cash was not really freely circulating until the market revolution. All right. So all of these changes are making America a much more industrial significant um, country. And as we're gonna see, the War of 1812 accelerates that uh, trend. All right. Now I said to you that the United States was beginning to get a foot in the door of worldwide shipping. Um, Americans were trading with China, they were involved in um, all kinds of shipping of products across the Atlantic. But then the Napoleonic Wars resumed after a brief hiatus, and we've got Britain and France fighting against each other again, and the United States has the um, official designation of neutral shipper. That is, they're not involved in the war, they haven't taken a side. But neither Britain nor France was a big respecter of neutral shipping rights in this period. The British began to sh uh, seize American ships that were going to the French West Indies, the Caribbean. Uh, Americans hated the British for interfering with their right to free trade. The French were also stopping American ships. So really, we were having a, a no-win situation when it came to trying to protect our right to neutral shipping. Could it be that we weren't getting much respect at that time? Like, as the U.S. was a new country, they didn't respect um, the U.S. as a power country compared to France and England and Spain? Yes, that's a big part of it. We didn't have much of a Navy at all. And also the United States was not willing to kind of play the diplomatic game in the way in which other countries were. 
So one of the reasons why we had fought a three-year undeclared war with France was the resistance of U.S. diplomats to give a bribe to, um, to Talleyrand, the head of the directory at that time. And another reason, or something that also happened in this time period, um, American ships were preyed upon by Barbary pirates, that is pirates from states along the northern coast of Africa. And France and Britain managed to get rid of the Barbary pirates by paying them an annual ransom. But the Americans, we, we didn't really have the money in the treasury to do that. And so ultimately, the US Marines ended up invading Tripoli in order to stop the, um, the war with the Barbary pirates. But we were not greatly respected in the world, partly because we're a young country and partly because we didn't have a great way to defend ourselves outside of our own borders. The issue of not being able to defend ourselves really comes to a head over the impressment um, problem. Impressment was when British naval ships stopped American ships and took off sailors and said, despite your claims that you're actually American, you're British, and we need you to fight in the war. So we're going to impress you into the Navy. We are going to, in other words, put you in the Navy regardless of your desire to not be in the Navy. Being in the Royal Navy was horrible. Um, in addition to all the fighting, because of course they're in the middle of a war, uh, there was a lot of corporal punishment aboard naval ships. If you did something that was counter to uh, a, an officer's order, you could be what was called flogged around the, the fleet. So taken aboard each ship in a harbor and you know, beaten in order to impress upon the other sailors as a form of deterrent that you don't do that. The food was terrible. Uh, lots of people got sick. Some people even got scurvy due to lack of vitamin C in their diet. So nobody wanted to be in the Royal Navy, pretty much. The British impressed about 6,000 Americans into the uh, Royal Navy before the War of 1812 started, over you know, that time period, to about 1805 and 1812. And at one point, a British ship, the Leopard, actually fired upon an American ship, the Chesapeake, because they refused to allow a British press gang to come on board and steal sailors. The Chesapeake's mast um, fell over, it was dismasted. It limped into port without its mast, and this was really an act of war. But at that point, in 1807, the US was not going to declare war against the British. Were we more focused on establishing a focus, like an economy and oh, shipping power and defending ourselves as a nation? There's partly that, and partly Jefferson, who was in power at this time, had other ideas, as we're going to see in a moment, about how maybe we could get the British and French off of our backs. Um, another issue was that people living in the West looking at um, conflicts with the Indians. Remember I talked about Tecumseh and Tesquitala and the Pan-Indian Wars and Tippecanoe. People that lived, lived in the West, in the new Western states, blamed the British for kind of um, giving the Indians comfort and help and guns. They were not wrong about this. You know, that was what was really going on. So there's a lot of anger building up on the American side. But as I said to you, Jefferson, who doesn't leave office until Jan or March of 1809, um, tried a bunch of other things before war would be declared by the next president. So here's what happened. In 1806, the United States decided well, Jefferson really decided, and Congress backed him up, that we needed a non-importation act. They were going to try to get Britain and France off of our backs by not importing anything from Britain or France. The notion here was that 
The United States was such a major importer of British and French goods that us refusing to buy things from them was going to hurt their economy. Jefferson, however, however, overestimated the amount to which, or the extent to which, the British relied on American grain. Um, people were pretty unhappy. People who were in American shipping along the northeastern tier of the United States were pretty unhappy with this because it was American ships that were moving a lot of this uh, grain back and forth. But anyway, the Non-Importation Act did not do what it was supposed to do. It did not stop Britain and France from preying on our shipping. So in 1807, an Embargo Act was passed. And an embargo is like a total cutoff of um, any kind of uh, export or import. So the United States is like cut off from trade with other countries on purpose. However, it ended up being a disaster. It caused an economic depression. Exports fell from $108 million a year to $22 million a year. Smuggling was endemic. People were smuggling things through the Caribbean or through Canada. And European nations started to pass retaliatory legislation against the United States. The embargo had to be repealed in 1809, after having proved an all-around disaster. And at this point, the next president, James Madison, comes in. Madison tried a non-intercourse act which opened up American trade with all nations except for Britain and France. But that didn't do anything to, you know, resolve the neutral shipping issue. And then finally in 1810, Macon's Bill Number 2 was like a last ditch effort to avoid war by saying, look, Britain and France, whichever one of you stops attacking us, it stops attacking our shipping, we'll trade with you and we won't trade with the other guy. But Macon's Bill number two didn't solve anything either. So there's this whole series of attempts. In 1812, a large uh, contingent of young congressmen from the West and South uh, was elected. They saw themselves as wanting to complete what the revolutionary generation had started. They wanted to get out from under Britain's shadow. They were proponents of Western expansion. Some of them even wanted to invade Canada. Finally, in June 1812, Madison yielded to their demands and declared war against Britain. And it was a very sectional vote on whether the United States should go to war. The, um, the West and the South were for the war. The Federalist Northeast, uh, where people were very involved with shipping, voted against. But anyway, starting in 1812, we are at war with Britain. Okay. Questions so far? But do you think the like the young congressmen coming in didn't really have an understanding of the interactions? Like people make their livelihoods off of the shipping, whereas like you said, they were trying to get out from the British shadow. Yeah, I think also that we can't underestimate the extent to which provincialism dominated in this period. People didn't see the United States as a unit still. People didn't really see the United States as a unit. This is why they said things like the United States are, are contemplating a war with Britain, not the United States is contemplating a war with Britain. 
It's not until after the Civil War that people start to refer to the United States as a coherent unit. So I think they just sort of didn't care about uh, New England. So this war starts, we've declared war against the largest and most expert naval power on the planet. But luckily for us, that naval power is very involved with fighting against France at the same time. Even so, the United States' initial movements in this war were just disastrous. Uh, the first thing that the U.S. tried to do was to invade Canada. There were attempts at invasion at three different points along the U.S. disputed northern border. New Englanders opposed the war, and so they didn't supply the troops. By supply the troops, I mean they didn't want to give them uh, food and stuff that they needed. Also, the troops themselves, who had been mustered largely from state militias, didn't want to cross the border. They said, that's not our purpose. Our purpose is to defend our state, to defend our nation maybe, but not to invade another country. So partially the issue was lack of supply. Part of it was the troops not wanting to go. And part of it was just really terrible leadership on the part of the um, officers. So the campaign against Canada was a complete failure. But then the United States had to deal with the fact that the British and their very impressive Navy blockaded the East Coast. The British troops actually invaded Washington, D.C. and burned many of the major government buildings, including the White House. The White House, uh, the Library of Congress was also burned. The people in the White House had to flee with um, James Madison's wife, Dolly, saving some of the important portraits that were hanging on the White House walls. So that naval blockade and the burning of Washington, D.C., one of the low points of the war. One of the sort of more bright spots from an American perspective was what happened on the Great Lakes. So you see the Great Lakes there, those uh, lake-shaped objects by Michigan and, uh, and New York. There were ships on the Great Lakes. Both the British and the U.S. maintained ships there. And um, one of the only times that there was an important American win during the War of 1812 happened in September 1813 when U.S. Commodore Oliver Perry, who was quite young, he was 28 years old, engaged the British on Lake Erie. Um, this was a long firefight among the ships. Perry actually lost his flagship. He had to kind of evacuate his ship and go on to the second best ship of the fleet. There were four hours of intense shelling. 80% of Perry's crew was killed. But Perry refused to give up. And finally, the entire British squadron on the Great Lakes surrendered to him. He became one of the great American heroes, military heroes of the early 19th century, and was famous for sending the message to General William Henry Harrison, we have met the enemy and he is ours. Um, another thing that happened during the war was the shelling of Fort McHenry in Baltimore by the British. This occurred, as you can see here, in September 1814. There was a lawyer, an American lawyer, by the name of Francis Scott Key, who was out on one of the British ships um, negotiating a prisoner exchange. He watched the Battle of Fort McHenry. There's a big American flag flying. He knew that if the um, commanders at Fort McHenry let down the flag, then that meant they were surrendering to the British. So he's watching the guns shooting and rockets flying through the air. But in the morning, the flag was still there. So the Battle of Fort McHenry uh, was a victory on the American side in the sense that they got pummeled and they managed to not surrender. He wrote a poem about this 
called the Star Spangled Banner. And a fun thing about it is a lot of songs in this time period were set to tunes that people already knew. And the Battle of Fort McHenry was set to a drinking song, a British drinking song called To Anacreon in Heaven, which is kind of a, a song praising the god of wine. So I'm going to briefly play you a little bit of that. Anacreon in heaven, where he sat in full glee. A few sons of harmony sent a petition that he their inspirer and patron would be. When this answer arrived from the jolly old Grecian, voice fiddle and flute no longer. And inspire you to boot And besides I'll instruct you like me to entwine The myrtle of Venus with Bacchus's vine All right, so there he is singing about entwining the myrtle of Venus with Bacchus's wine Or in other words, singing about wine and women And that is the song that our national anthem is set to Any, oh, any question while I'm changing screens here? Um, to what extent would you consider this war to be industrialized? Um, to what extent is it industrialized? I would say yeah. not to any great, uh, very great extent whatsoever. I mean, the Civil War uh you could argue has more industrial elements to it um but really people talk about the first industrialized war being uh the first world war and i think that's probably correct so how was our standing army compared to our navy like our navy wasn't anything did we have a standing army or was it the state's militia it was the state's militia yeah we really due to um sort of washington's in, in, uh, influence and advocacy of isolationism, we had really cut down the army. The idea in early America was that a standing army was a facet of um, totalitarian states, you know, of authoritarian regimes, of monarchies. Nobody wanted to have a standing army because they were, um, they deprived people of their liberties. And so these militias were supposed to be able to be summoned into action, but mainly to protect the U.S. rather than to wage war outwardly. Oh, I forgot to say something, which, let me go back to this slide. The most uh, decisive victory for the Americans occurred two weeks after the war was over, because while the war was being fought, um, some diplomats were sent to Ghent in Belgium, and there they negotiated the end of the war, and the Treaty of Ghent put things back to the way they were before. That's called the status quo antebellum. So territories were not gained or lost. But the war was still significant in proving that the United States was not a colony of Great Britain anymore. I would say the war was also important in that, little side note, New England almost seceded over the war. And there was a discussion by various New England states in something called the Hartford Convention about whether they should secede now that the rest of the country was no longer going in the right direction for them. <laughs> 
But anyway, back to the Battle of New Orleans. This battle happened in January of 1815. General Pakenham, a British general, kind of swept into New Orleans with a large number of troops. Andrew Jackson was down there, had a much smaller number of troops, and they were really quite a diverse lot. There were Creoles, there were French pirates. He actually uh, impressed into service enslaved people from Louisiana plantations, promising them freedom if they actually won the battle and then reneging on that promise. So that was quite rude of him. The Americans built a fort out of cotton and they were in a good defensive position even though they were well outnumbered. The British approached, uh, the Americans repelled them, they actually killed General Pakenham, who really didn't want to be buried on American soil, so he was put into a vat of brine and brought back to Britain like as if he were a pickle. Um, so that was a great decisive victory. It made Jackson even more of a military hero than he already was. However, it happened after the war. Well, immediately after this war, which Americans considered that they had won, they began to feel a new sense of nationalism, faith in their federal government, economic prosperity. And the election of James Monroe marked a folding of both existing political parties into one political party. There was so little party feeling between 1817 and 1825 and newspaper editors called this the era of good feelings. Economic growth had occurred during the War of 1812 because we couldn't really trade with the British. So a lot of domestic manufacture was started up during that time. And Henry Clay, who was one of the Warhawk generation of people elected in 1810, came up with the idea of the American system a three-point plan to increase support for American business, which goes like this. First of all, a rechartering of the National Bank. Second of all, a tariff on imported goods. And third of all, support for internal improvements or what was meant by internal improvements in this time is infrastructure. Now to go through each of these in turn, the National Bank was rechartered in 1816. It was chartered for 20 years. This is gonna be important in lecture 15. The National Bank at this point was called the Second Bank of the United States. It was located in Philadelphia. And it was actually a private bank. That is, it was stock and it was owned by shareholders. It was not a creature of the federal government. So, you know, stuff is going to happen as a result of that. A tariff on imported goods makes imported goods more expensive than domestically produced goods. And so this was meant to nurture American industry. Congress put tariffs on things like imported cotton, hats, paper, sugar, wool, iron. And then the final aspect of the American system was internal improvements, the buildings of road, the building of roads and canals. All right, so the era of good feeling ceases nurturing of American economics. The market revolution then doesn't take place in a vacuum, but it takes place in a, uh, a world of uh, government support for industry. The other important thing that happens during the administration of James Monroe is that expert diplomacy was conducted by John Quincy Adams, his Secretary of State. 
So in 1819, the United States acquired Florida as a territory from the Spanish. Florida had been a battleground between escaped enslaved people and Creek refugees who um, together they formed themselves into a tribe called Seminoles and Anglo troops. So there were some Anglo settlers who were squatting in Spanish territory. Jackson was down there leading Anglo troops against them. Um, this kind of caused the Spanish to see this as a very expensive proposition to keep Florida. And so the Adams on East Treaty, you know, the Spanish were glad to give it up. Then Jackson, who had been down there with the troops, became the first territorial governor of Florida. In 1823, the Monroe Doctrine was issued. 1821 had seen a number of Latin American states declare their independence from the Spanish Empire. And so first the United States recognized the independence of these countries, which included Argentina, Colombia, and Chile. And then set forth a doctrine named after the president at the time that the United States would not allow any intervention in the Western Hemisphere by European powers. Any attack by a European power in the Western Hemisphere would be considered an attack on the U.S. So the Monroe Doctrine is the United States declaring, much to the amusement of the British, that we got the whole Western Hemisphere, we're the ones in charge, we're going to protect the Western Hemisphere you know, the whole point was we didn't want European nations coming in and taking over these nascent democracies of South America. Finally, Russia gave up its claim to parts of the American West Coast through the Convention of 1824. So what's called the Oregon Territory, which includes what's today Oregon and Washington state. There had been a Russian presence there, the Russians backed off. So you can see how Adams was a very effective diplomat. And it is from the position of Secretary of State that he will mount his campaign for the presidency in 1824. 